For 30 years, my colleagues and I have been studying how people change their behaviors on their own with psychotherapy, with coaches, and the like. So Jim Pachowska, Carlo Di Clementi, and I have defined these stages of change. And these are well known to most coaches, pre-contemplation or denial, contemplation, preparation, action, and then most importantly, maintenance. But that's not really the, the take home message, Joan. It is, once you understand your client's stage of change, then you'll know what to do that particularly help them move forward in achieving their goals. So there's a focusing in on each stage and interventional techniques? Or... What we call stage matching, doing the right thing at the right time. You know, so many of our clients are well motivated are consciously and unconsciously directed toward achieving their dreams, and yet they're doing the wrong thing at the right time. So, so many of them try to use willpower when they're trying to change a behavior. Well, it turns out that getting yourself psyched and motivated and getting aware is very useful when you're beginning a behavior change. But those same change catalysts backfire and make it almost impossible to achieve the goal. So it's doing the right things at the right time. The emotional and awareness early on, and then what we may call cognitive behavioral methods in order to uh, reach the goal and maintain it. Cool. And if I understand correctly, there's a lot of research going on behind all of this. Oh yes, in the last 30 years, my colleagues have secured uh, almost $100 million of federal research uh, grant money. This has now been applied to 50 or 60 problem behaviors. There's more than 2,000 peer-reviewed articles on it. So it is truly a science of behavior change. Wow, so it's very impressive and in our coaching field to see that level of research is, you know, hopefully will become more common. Very cool. Um, can you give me a couple of examples about how you would, how would you would, um, identify where somebody is on sure. the spectrum. So we, of course, have lots of paper and pencil measures to assess the stages of change, but a coach can do it, and in fact, a, a client, a layperson can do it within a few moments. And the first notion that's important here is that the stages of change is behavior specific. So you may, for example, be in action in trying to lose weight, but in pre-contemplation with regard to a relationship. And you may be in maintenance on an exercise regimen. So each behavior, each goal is stage specific. And you could just ask a few questions. Um, so we would ask, for example, do you think um, this particular behavior is a problem for you or would you like to change it? If the client says yes, then logically you know that they're going to be in contemplation, preparation, or action they see a goal or a problem they would like to change. If they say no to that initial question, then you know they're in pre-contemplation. It is in fact a problem, but they're not yet aware or willing to own it. Or they think they've already changed it and they're in the maintenance. So the first question is, do you think this is a problem or would you like to change it? By the way, we express it both ways. Some people like to put it as a goal attainment and yet other people like to identify it as a problem. Either way, it works. The follow-up question then is immediately, well, when would you like to try to change it? And if they say, well, I'm working up to it, that's the hallmark of contemplation. They know it's a problem, they're owning it, but they're not ready yet. Other people will say, I'm almost there, and that's the preparation stage in which you're taking little baby steps getting ready. And other people say, right now. Now, if they say, I don't think it's a problem for me, you know, a coach wants to look at them and say, geez, DWIs, divorces, you've been fired, you just you want to smack them almost. But we're going to manage our emotional reactions and our countertransference and say, and, and I hope genuinely ask, well, what leads you to say that? And then you begin to probe what are the sources of motivations and, and what are they really experiencing about the problem? So asking those two questions do you see this as a goal for yourself or a problem to be solved? And then the follow-up, well, when would you like to change it? Immediately identifies whether you're in pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, or maintenance. It's, um, I love the way that you've broken it down because I think for the coach and for the client, it's, it's, it's very user-friendly. 
Yes, and in the book Changeology, as well as the free website, changeologybook.com, people can go on and just click it. So whether they're coaches or clients, for any behavior problem, just go online and uh, knock yourself out. Can you talk to me a little bit about the later stages, about when somebody is in action or when somebody is in maintenance and what sure. you recommend? And there's some uh, fascinating research that suggests that people who seek out coaches tend to be further along in the stages of change. So it's exactly, Joan, those later stages of change that most coaches are more likely to see. So action is, I am ready to go. Now, unfortunately, the entire world equates change with a single stage of action. They forget there was a part in which they denied it, then they thought about it, and then they got ready. That's very sad because we know if you do that, you're mistreating or mismatching the majority of the population since at any one time, only 20% of the entire population is in the action stage for any given problem. So just think, take an easy problem like smoking. At any one time, only about 20% of smokers are actively trying to quit. So it is a later stage, and of course we have now oodles of research that show if you get clients in the action stage, you're likely to be far more successful. In fact, they're the ones I tried to select for my own clinical trainees because they have early uh, success with people in action who are motivated, aware, and ready to go. In those stages, um, rewarding, developing new skills, rearranging the environment, and a strong helping relationship from the coach are those things that we know will propel people through action into the maintenance stage. Can you be a little more specific using whatever example you like? Sure, so they're the four big catalysts that we know that work for action. So the helping relationship is of course the support, the validation, working with people's ambivalence. The reward is helping them internally reward themselves. That may be an attaboy or keep it going. That may be a contingency contract with loved ones. That may be when a goal was met for the day, giving them a reward, such as watching their favorite shows, or withdrawing those customary reinforcements when a client doesn't meet them. And the one we've discovered, interestingly, that virtually no one's using is environmental control. That is, rearranging the environment to help rather than hurt the client. You know, humans are the only mammals who can really control their environment. We sometimes forget that and think it all occurs inside the head. But in fact, this environmental control allows us to prompt the behavior or to try to minimize the slips. So you'd be, uh, you'd be suggesting as a coach that the client um, identify the triggers for the behavior. That's exactly right, and then try to minimize those. So much as they say in 12-step tradition, who are the people, places, and things that are triggering this problem behavior? So you try to minimize, at least in the short run, uh, exposure to those people or those situations. And then, of course, you can also put things into the environment that help you. Little reminders, post-its, people signing up for occasional uh, reminders or boosters and the like. And the one that most coaches immediately get is the building in the new skills. You know, we used to think when someone couldn't follow through on an action plan, it was somehow an unconscious conflict. And to be sure, that sometimes is uh, indeed the case. But other times, they just lack skills, particularly people coming from early childhoods in which they did not have effective models to show them how to navigate life. We have many clients who just literally don't know the skills, how to communicate effectively to keep eye contact, how to, um, how to have an argument with a partner without it leading to uh, physical abuse how to relax instead of uh, stress, how to be mindful rather than being impulsive. For practically every problem behavior, there's an opposite healthy behavior. And we can't just teach people or preach it, we literally need to show them the new skills. Let me circle back, John, if I can. Um, at the very beginning, you talked about the very common response that most of us have of, oh, well, it's just willpower. What would you say about that? Well, we've done lots of research on this notion of willpower. We prefer to call it self-liberation. It is necessary, but not sufficient. 
Uh, I know that's filled with a little jargon, so let me unpack that. Some degree of willpower, a commitment of liberating yourself from the problem and seeking the goal is indeed important. And in dozens of our studies, it does predict people moving into the action stage. But willpower by itself, at the exclusion of these other change catalysts, actually predicts failure. Because people rely so much, I'm going to do it, that's it. So they don't rearrange their environment, they don't learn new skills, they say I don't need other people's support, they don't buddy up, they don't reinforce themselves internally or externally. So they try to just will themselves through a problem. Those people fail at a higher rate. So it's necessary but not sufficient. As we say, willpower plus. You need to use these other change catalysts as well. Do you, um, do you find certain techniques more effective in the action and maintenance stage, stages? You bet. Others? But we avoid the word techniques. Okay. So if you think about how most people have been trained to be coaches, therapists, teachers, they can be trained at the high level of theories. So this would be coaching theories, change theories, psychotherapy or counseling theories. And then some people are trained at the very low level of techniques. Right? Just give me the techniques and methods, tell me what to do. It turns out, Joan, from decades of research, that neither of those predict success. So let me say that again. Neither the theory you're using nor the particular technique predicts success of you working with clients. What the experts do use and what does predict success are the use of these change catalysts. So let me give you the example in action. We know every client just can't root out a problem. You need to build in a positive, healthy alternative to that behavior. So in different ways, that's called coping methods. We use it in the stages of change as countering. What's the healthy alternative to the behavior? There are literally dozens of techniques for that. Exercise instead of sedentary. Exposure instead of procrastination. Relax instead of anxiety. Goal set rather than avoidance. So here's what's interesting. None of those particular techniques predict who does well. Right? So if you look at the study, say for depression, does cognitive therapy work any better than getting people behaviorally active versus people being emotionally activated? It turns out, no. They all work about the same. But notice, all of those techniques are still part of the countering catalyst. So what we train people to do is to look at the change catalyst or process, not the particular technique. Once you understand the catalyst of the healthy opposite, the countering, you can then develop literally dozens of techniques. You decide which ones you as a coach are comfortable with, and more importantly, that might help your client, and you use one of those. So we know the countering catalyst absolutely is imperative, but the particular technique, not so important. Very interesting. Um, is the same model applicable at all ages and stages? Yes, um, and I must uh, say here that I used to believe that was not the case. So in our first five or 10 years of uh, research, uh, Jim Prochaska, my long-term collaborator, and I used to have this argument. Our first two grants were, were smokers and with alcohol abusers. So I thought it was largely, the stages of model, largely relegated to addictions. But after 25 more years and 60 more problem behaviors, it's pretty clear this is the structure of behavior change. People move through pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance for virtually every problem behavior. It's been used around the world by governments, by pharmaceutical companies, for voluntary, involuntary changes, for personal changes, for organizational changes. So with some egg on my face, I'm here to say I was wrong. This is how people change. Um, just because it's my interest, um, how would you use this with a child? Well, we, we certainly wouldn't use these highfalutin terms, pre-contemplation, yeah. contemplation. So on one of my slides for my workshops, I have how you are going to say this for the child. So it's going to get ready to run, get set, run, and keep running. And you know, with adults, we actually help them understand the stages. 
so that they can generalize it to other problems and other goals in their lives. With the child, we're going to do most, most of that work. And if anybody reflects on this, uh, you know, the stages just make perfect sense. When I tell someone, well, well, tell me about how to bake an apple pie. They'll usually say, well, first you buy apples. And I say, well, wait a minute. Aren't there really some stages before that? And they'll say, well, of course there are. First, you have to want to bake it, and then you have to find time to bake it. And I say, exactly so. So as we like to say, the stages of change were, in fact, developed because clients kept asking us, well, when? When in the cycle of change? And then that led to this uh, 30 years of large-scale research trying to identify what works when. So it's not just so much that there's stages of change or steps of change. It's uh, there's profound differences in success if you get the people to do the right thing at the right time. And that means for, to oversimplify the awareness and the emotion early on, getting psyched, getting motivated. But then when you start to change, you need to stop some of those and then go for the more behavioral. And that's that helping relationship, the, stimu the environmental control, learning new, healthier behaviors. And I'll say it again, uh, changing the environment because that is so under neglected. What do you think is next? What's the, what are the cutting edges in changeology or in the change field? Oh, three or four things immediately come to mind, Joan. First, of course, is technology. Uh, the apps are coming out. Um, along with the changeology book, people can immediately go on and assess their own stage of change and then see exactly what they're doing and they're not doing. Um, so much of this is going from, um, I'll say, face-to-face -face individual work to largely um, online applications and group work. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, the National Health Service, Romania, I'm uh, next week in Japan, all of them are adopting this. So no longer are we doing one person at a time, we're really thinking about health populations. And my colleague, Jim Prochask, has been uh, very much leading the way. You know, most, most large behavioral problems are not solved one person at a time. It's for the entire populations. So we'll see all this going online. We'll see it increasingly applied to entire populations. Very exciting. It is very exciting. And what's next for you? What's next for me is, um, I think, pretty much sharing the good uh, news. After 30 years, uh, we're pretty clear how people change. You know, this has been done with tens of thousands of people, and as I mentioned, millions of dollars of federal research funds. So it's a fairly busy life trying to teach, hold a practice, and uh, share the good news. But that's exactly why I wrote Changeology. Um, that gets to a lot more people than uh, this poor old tired body can do. Well, I thank you very much. I think it's very relevant to our coaches in whatever realm they're coaching. We think so too, be that healthcare, executive, or personal coaching. This is the structure of behavior change. So I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here and I thank you for hosting me, Joe.